And a good chunk of their argument relied on uh, the idea that people eat their eggs quickly in the morning. Because I guess eggs don't eggs don't stay good for very long, so everyone eats them quickly. So Corey must have eaten breakfast with her husband at a certain time. And this week we had the preliminary hearing for Corey Richens, who is charged with the poisoning death murder of her husband, Eric. Well, let's talk about it. I'm your host, Annette Lyon, USA Today bestselling author of the suspense novel, Just One More, and a whole bunch of other stuff. I'm also a woman of faith, member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, true crime junkie, chocoholic, all the good stuff, which is why we are here and we are talking about the Corey Ridgens case. That's a very quick overview. Her husband, Eric, died on March 4th, 2023. It was ruled... Uh, overdose of fentanyl. He had five times the least lethal amount in his system. And at first it was considered to be an accidental overdose. It changed. Corey was a real estate developer. Mostly she would buy, fix up, and flip houses. But she decided to take on a new venture after her husband died and she wrote a children's book called Are You With Me? And the idea was that she and her sons had struggled to grieve their father's death. I believe she had three sons. That she just didn't find any books out there for children dealing with this kind of thing. And so she decided to write it. So she wrote this book. I believe she self-published it. No shade on that. Just that's that's what, one reason it came out as quickly as it did. Because you have more control over those things. And then as she was promoting the book, she pitched it to a morning like lifestyle show called Good Things You Taught. It comes on after Good Morning America. She talked about the book and her husband's sudden death and this and that. Shortly after her appearance, people in the newsroom start getting emails saying she had something to do with her husband's death. She's not innocent. She's a murderer. Da, da, da. And they're like, well, what is going on here? She was later arrested for poisoning her husband. So this week we had the preliminary hearing, which was, of course, that they present evidence both sides to basically the judge is deciding whether there is enough evidence to even try the case. And so it's in Summit County. That is uh, Heber, Camas, I believe Park City is in there. She lived in Camas, which is the same area, ironically, as Ballerina Farm. Catherine Heigl has a ranch up there. Very rural area, but it's not too far from places like Park City, Heber, and about an hour you get to Salt Lake. One thing I found interesting, just and I found this particularly interesting for Utah, which is a very religious state, that the oath for swearing in doesn't end with, so help me God, or so help you God. You know, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God. It ends with, subject to the pains and penalties of perjury. I thought it was interesting. I don't know about the Summit County thing or a Utah state thing. I hadn't seen that before. We got Judge Richard Mrazek. So the first witness they put on the stand was O'Driscoll, who was the main detective on this particular case. He took it over in March of 2023 after the original lead, Detective Woody, moved to part. Like he wasn't there the morning after when during the initial search of the house, you know, just finding the body and taking care of the scene. So there were questions that were asked of him, like, were there drugs found on the scene or seized it was this kind of, what all was seized at the scene and he says i don't know i wasn't there he'd have to look at the log he does remember that there were prescription medications of eric's that were seized but he wasn't there during the initial search so i was wondering why did not they not bring detective woody back and have her on the stand since she was there that was odd to me maybe they've addressed that elsewhere but so yeah, again he testified that the cause of death was drug intoxication with fentanyl with, i guess again five times a lethal dose with more in his stomach he didn't know if any drinkware had been taken from the house at the scene but some was later taken they did find some prescription opiates that were not in their original bottle and they were not fentanyl but he didn't know what they were and they also found some thc gummies but he wasn't sure when those were found so he talks about his interview with Corey. That was on April 14th, 13 months after Eric's death in April of 2023. So Eric died in March 4th of 2022. Detective O'Driscoll and Sergeant Hoffmeyer did the first interview at Corey's house. Partway through, her mom shows up and it was her mom who was like, well, her lawyer should be here. 
at the end of the interview, he did say, yeah, you could have a lawyer present. And the defense was trying to make it look like this was police misconduct. This is the only time he offered a lawyer. And I'm thinking, so what? She knows that she can have a lawyer, especially if he Mirandized her. I don't know if he did. She's having an affair. Corey was having an affair. And they would refer to him as Mr. Grossman or her paramour. Just jumped out at me. Every time I heard paramour, I was like, what? But he was looked at as an alternate suspect initially. They talked about Carmen Lager. She was a person of interest for the police very early on. Um, she had connections with the Richenses and a drug history and drug court in another county within Utah. Corey had met Carmen because Carmen did cleaning services. And I guess it was through Corey's aunt originally had used Carmen. And then Corey started using her for some of the rental properties that she had as well as her own home. But yeah, Carmen was the target of a completely separate drug investigation. And she was arrested on those charges in April of 2023. They did a bunch of interviews with her related to this case as well. Because they felt that she knew more than she was letting on. They had to point out to her that you had several drug charges going on right now. And those are violations of your parole. As is the fact that she had a weapon, a, a firearm, that she wasn't allowed to have one as a convicted felon. And that's a, a, another violation of her parole. You have a lot of serious charges here. And we might be able to work with you. If you're willing to work with us in our investigation, we might be able to get some of those charges minimized or, or, or removed. The defense was saying that he was making promises he couldn't keep. It sounded like he was probably saying more than he probably should have on some of that, but I don't know the legal stuff on that, so let the lawyers hash that one out. The next month, on May 12th, they had several interviews, but apparently on this one, she finally admitted that she knew more than she had been letting on. They thought that she would be testifying in a grand jury. He said he didn't know if that had happened or not. I heard somewhere else that Utah doesn't have grand juries. So that was a weird statement if because he's referring to a grand jury that she would need to testify in. Or maybe it's federal cases that, that have grand juries in Utah, but not state ones. I'll have to look and talk to some lawyers and find out. But O'Driscoll said he didn't know what had happened with her drug charges. But allegedly... Carmen had three transactions with Corey to get illicit drugs. The first was on February 11th of 2022, and one of the charges against Corey is attempted murder and poisoning of Eric on Valentine's Day, on February 14th, and they say that that did not succeed. He got sick, but it wasn't enough, and then she tried again, and it worked the second time. So the first time she got drugs from Carmen was on February 11th, attempted killing, February 14th. The next time was February 26th, and he died on March 4th. Then she had got more drugs on March 9th, after he died. Now, some people then point to that and say, well, she was just getting the drugs for herself this whole time, and she was using the drugs. Or it could be, arguably, that she was, if she's trying to get more drugs, maybe to plant in the house, or to show that she was using, pretend that she was using drugs, so, so she's not involved in his death, whatever. There's all kinds of possible reasons she was getting drugs after his death. O'Driscoll estimated 15 to 30 pills per transaction in three transactions, so 45 to 90 pills total, and no, none had ever been found. But they know those, those transactions did happen. They also didn't search for them. It wasn't until April after Eric had died that they searched the house. That's a long time. He, she easily could have gotten rid of any pills that, it, that were... Heck, she could have taken them. Then the defense was trying to, and this is a pattern, of course, defense always trying to make it look like the police have done some sort of misconduct in their investigation. Did you ever have an unrecorded interviews with Carmen? And he said, no, no unrecorded interviews. There may have been some unrecorded conversations because there were times that she didn't have a car to get to an interview at the police station. We had to pick her up. So we'd have small talk in the car but nothing related to the case went unrecorded. Then we had uh, the next witness was Christopher Cotrodimos. So he is a veteran of law enforcement. He'd been on his homicide unit and a bunch of other things. Now he's a consultant uh, about uh, uh, for digital communications. And so he was analyzing the extracted data off of cell phone. Calls and messages between Corey and Carmen said on February 10th, there were several calls. The next day, on February 11th, there were 30, 30-ish messages, and that was the day that, of the first uh, drug transaction that we know. The next day, there were more messages. And this is one of those cases where the, the provider didn't save the actual text content. These are texts that were sent and received, so there was a completed message. The 30 messages on February 11th, the day of the actual purchase, more messages the next day. 
then another 30 or so the day of the first murder attempt on Valentine's Day. Then on February 26, which is the day of the second transaction of drugs, there were a lot of messages between about 4 or 5 p.m. that lasted until about 10 p.m., a whole bunch going back and forth during that five to six hour period. Now, he also then points out that there was cell tower activity that, that put Corey at, at a specific Maverick gas station on three dates, February 11th, February 26th, and March 9th. And those are the dates of the three transactions for drugs. They didn't see her phone ever hit ping near that tower again. Only on those those three dates, which are the three dates we know that there were drug transactions with Carmen. Corey's phone messages with, let's see, it said Mr. Jeff. I'm not quite sure who he is, but it included an 8 a.m. phone call to a diner where she picked up some breakfast takeout meal. That was the day of the first attempt to kill him. They say that she placed his breakfast sandwich bagel thing with fentanyl and then left the house for several hours. He calls her at 11.09 a.m. On, on Valentine's Day saying, I'm really, well, we don't know what he actually said, but purportedly that he was feeling really sick and really gross. He sent her a photo at 11.27. We don't know what photo that was, but that he, that just that he sent it and it's been since been deleted. And that he texted her right about the same time that he was so sick, he thought he, he might go to the hospital if he didn't feel better soon. And she sends a couple of things that are like, oh, that's, do you want me to come home? That's too bad. Go take a nap. That was it. Then there's no, there's nothing on his phone at all for, the, for like two hours, roughly 1130-ish to 130-ish p.m. while he's sleeping. And Corey is off with her boyfriend, Paramour, Josh Grossman, thinking he's, he's getting poisoned and is going to be dead when she gets home. There's a screenshot that Corey took on her phone, sent to Josh Grossman, at 9.48 a.m. on that same day, saying that she's leaving the house and she's heading to wherever he was at that point, ETA, and she'd get there in about an hour. Their relationship began the previous November. Some of their communications were things about, oh, I just, if you were just out of the picture, we could be have this happy life together. I can't bear the idea of putting my kids through a divorce, blah, blah, blah. They did, of course, did a extraction on Josh's phone as well. Of course, there's a whole bunch between her and him. There is even... One text that she said that she, you know, just wait until Friday. Just hang on, wait until Friday, then he'll be out of the picture or something along those lines. Specifically, wait until Friday was was in there. That is the day that Eric died. He died early, early on the 4th. They talked about how a, a device related to her phone, likely a smartwatch, something like that, was unlocked at 3.07 a.m. And it tracked movement for the next in the next minute later for about 250 feet and then it unlocked again 15 minutes later um, and then more movement of 143 feet followed by 911 call so we have about a 370 feet of movement in a 15 minute period in the middle of the night and that's likely when he died well, first it was reported that he had had a moscow mule now we know it was a lemon shot and the prosecution says that she learned from the first attempt that number one, he needed to have a much higher dose than what she had the first time. And number two, he needed to have the dose all at once, not like in a sandwich that so he took a couple bites, started to feel gross and then did, never finished it. So I had to go down all at once. Hence, the sh she put it in a shot. She just downed the whole thing all at once. So they say she learned from her first attempt. Then a forensic accountant named Brooke Carrington took the stand. She had worked for the uh, the Richens family for four or five months, then stopped when the state hired her to work on this case because that would have been a conflict of interest. So she went over a whole bunch of different accounts and loans, real estate properties. Uh, it was a long testimony, but the upshot was that Corey was in a lot of debt and had maxed out her credit, that she had maxed out even home equity loans and a bunch of other things. Some of her loans had pretty high interest rates. And she was struggling to pay repay any of that back. Now, there was also life insurance fraud going on, and there was one policy that was opened up really close to when Eric died, and it was one that did not require a physical, and it was basically just sign this form. It's like a, one of those credit union things. You can get this extra amount of life insurance for really cheap or nothing and just sign this and send it back. So they say that the signature on that application appears to be forged. 
that they think that she's the one who actually applied for it before he died. And then the defense said it, that actually was such a small amount. It was only like $100,000 compared to the other life insurance policies that they ha already had on him. And my response to that would be, but she was in a whole lot of debt. And if she could have got, gotten any little bit to relieve some of that real estate debt, we're talking millions of dollars, but $100,000 would go a long way to get those creditors off her back for a while. Brooke Carrington also talked about this a trust that was created with Eric's sister being the trustee that would put a lot of his property and business stuff under and out within this trust and that would keep it from from Corey being able to have access she did, does not know for sure if Corey was aware of the trust but she didn't think so she thinks that that uh, eric put it together without her knowing because he was afraid of a divorce or something happened to him she he didn't want her getting hold of his assets but it's kind of connecting her to the actual murder the state made some really good arguments, again, about how she learned a lot from the first time, using the higher dose, the lemon shot, all the texts to her boyfriend supporting all of the things that she learned, her plans, the GPS pings, that her she's the one maverick. She's only ever there three times, and those are the same three days when she bought drugs from Carmen. Interestingly enough, the, the defense wasn't even arguing that there wasn't drug purchases. I thought it was interesting. Um, one argument they did make was that, well, Corey might not have known what drug she got. It could have been something else. She didn't know it was fentanyl necessarily. And the judge actually was like, belief is all that matters at this point. Belief and her intent. If she thought it was fentanyl and put it in his drink, that's what matters. It doesn't matter if it actually wasn't fentanyl or if, if it was something else. It's like if she believes it, and it's like, it's like that's, that's a ridiculous argument. But no. Some of the defense's arguments as they were closing, their arguments didn't make sense in my opinion. They said that the cell data proves that she couldn't have done it, which their walkthrough, I was like, what are you? No, that, that doesn't seem to make sense. And a good chunk of their argument relied on uh, the idea that people eat their eggs quickly in the morning because I guess eggs don't eggs don't stay good for very long so everyone eats them quickly so Corey must have eaten breakfast with her husband at a certain time or what I, I don't know it, it didn't make a lot of sense her timing didn't it didn't matter and also like what the defense also said that Eric's text uh, saying that I'm gonna go lie down if I don't feel better I'm gonna go to the hospital the way he phrased it showed that he must have sent several messages or he, that he must have mentioned his illness before. Not necessarily the way he phrased it, but he also there was also a phone call logged between their phones a few minutes before that. So I, what are you getting into? It's just bizarre. And somehow we need to get sick faster. Like, it, I don't know. It, did, it, it really didn't make a lot of sense. Here is a clip from Judge Mrazek that just brought joy to my heart because he's talking to the one of the defense counsel. Let's watch it. In your view, can the court consider Ms. Ridgen's text messages to Mr. Grossman on February 15th? Can I consider them at all? To, can you consider them? I mean, I think you can consider anything you want to consider in terms of well, see, that's the question. The Utah Rules of Evidence say, no, there's all kinds of stuff you can't consider under right. these uh, set of circumstances. And it's often a difficult slalom course to ski. We did some of this yesterday morning, yes. trying to get a sense from the defense of whether or not the court can consider things like the text measured quote, if he would just go away, end quote. So or as evidence of an inference that she wanted him not around anymore. But that could be divorce. That doesn't matter. I have to understand, be death. <laughs> and we're not in trial, and I'm not a jury, and so I have to contend with but how black you... letter law. Let me just get this out. I, I really am genuinely interested in your response. I acknowledge there are multiple credible inferences that can be drawn from this evidence. Several of them innocent, but I'm not allowed to pick and choose. I am not allowed to weigh the relative reasonableness or credibility of the inferences. I'm required 
to draw all reasonable inferences in the state's favor, to view the evidence as a whole in the state's favor, and identify is there a reading of the evidence that supports a reasonable belief. And so when you say things like, look, this evidence, she went home, I imagine Mr. Bloodworth is fighting the urge to jump up and say, and that just shows she went home to give up the same. You stuck around through the end. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for being here and supporting the channel. Give this video a like. It really helps the algorithm. And if you're new, please subscribe and hit that notification bell. And you can find me online on all the socials. I'm very easy to find. Just search for Annette Lyon. Go get yourself some chocolate. Let me know what you think in the comments. This is a crazy case and I uh, want to hear what you think about it.